It would be it would be uh, very convenient and comforting if technology were the answer, because then we wouldn't really have to change our ways. We would just let the scientists do it, come up with the next gee whiz invention, and the problem is solved. That, of course, ignores the centuries-long history of technology creating new problems that were unanticipated that must be met with even more technology and more technology and more technology. So it becomes an addiction. Once you go down that path, you depend, you become dependent on the technology. Once you start fertilizing crops with um, synthetic fertilizers, once you start relying on weed killers, um, once the soil is degraded, then you depend on those inputs even to maintain a normal, um, you know, what had been normal. So it's an addiction. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, an addiction to keep up, yeah, and you, you probably need, need yeah. more. Right, higher and higher dose. So the phenomenon of unintended consequences, where technology creates even more problems that need to be meet, met with more technology, that is inevitable because technology and this scientific reductionistic approach to anything, especially agriculture, it always leaves something out. It leaves out because science is based on only the things we can measure. So if there's anything important that we don't measure or can't measure, then it's going to cause problems. It gets neglected. It gets destroyed. It causes problems in the future. Biodiversity so, plus a yeah. million other things are like, ah, yeah, we yeah. forgot about the insects and we forgot about this and we forgot about right. it or we didn't see it until it disappeared. 50 years ago, soil scientists thought that that soil was a collection of chemicals and that if there were and if, and if the soil wasn't fertile that means that you could add all you have to do is add whatever is lacking and it like would a be growth fertile. medium basically yeah it was a neutral right. thing that you yeah. right mm. right so they didn't understand the importance of uh you know the the soil microbiome they didn't understand the importance of of the mycelial networks you know they didn't understand the importance of life that was left out of the calculations so if we're going to t rely on technology to solve our problems, we have to ask, well, what are we leaving out of our calculations now? What is important that we don't know is important? And as we can probably assume that we don't know most of it, we, we sort of have to assume that we cannot go for the easy fixes or the on paper easy fixes, because it always sounds easy on paper and then 20, 30, 10 year or two years down the line, we, we notice that actually we created more issues with that. Yeah. Then the natural, I mean, they're, they're two, then maybe somebody in this in this amazing theater we're in, somebody raises their hand and says, yeah, that Charles, it all sounds nice and, and funny, but um, with this life approach and, and the original organic, etc., how we're going to feed the world. I, I get a question a lot from, especially people that haven't visited a farm recently, uh, but how, how do we... Like there are all these numbers and we have to feed 10, million, 10 billion people and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have an amazing short, which I will definitely put in the show notes as well, uh, a short audio clip. I think it's seven minutes where you talk a bit about the, um, the history of these models of this research on feeding the planet. And the question, I think the title is literally, can we feed the world regeneratively? But if you had to summarize that, or so actually we can take easily seven minutes for that. What, what do you normally say when people say, yeah, how do we feed the world with this stuff? It sounds great, very, very, it sounds even a bit yeah. naive, and it sounds like a place that would like to be, these type of farms, etc., or these type of landscapes, let's make it a bit broader. But but can we feed the world with that? Right, so this is, yeah, I've, I've gotten this criticism before. It's very privileged of you to think that we could all eat organic agriculture, but the world's poor can't do that. We have to maximize production to feed the so starving people. So how bad people. of you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're starving people, basically. Um, yeah. So, so that, that critique is really based, I'm sorry to say it, but it's based on ignorance. And it's based on um, faulty models. It's based on a very selective historical understanding. Uh, in fact, when organic or regenerative agriculture is done properly, it can produce a lot more food than monocrop agriculture. If you, but it depends on how you do the comparison. So if you're going to compare organic row crops with conventional row crops and hold everything else constant, then the conventional is going to outperform the organic. 
especially if it's a, you know, if you're just taking two blank fields and you're controlling all the variables except one. Do you use pesticides on this and not on that? That's just one variable. But organic agriculture isn't like that. You can't hold variables constant. If you're really in the true spirit of it, the growing practices in every place will be unique to that place. So you can't really do side-by-side -side comparisons like that. For organic and regenerative uh, agriculture to reach its potential in terms of yield, that requires years and decades of building soil, of learning the land, of learning what works in that microclimate, of, of building a relationship. So and building that microclimate even from scratch right. in many cases, yeah. Right, so if you did that, if you somehow could do a study where you compare that true organic practice over 30 years to conventional practices over 30 years, you get very different results. But even, you know, even without doing that, there's still an awful lot of data that shows that that small diverse farms can outperform large farms. But it depends on the crops too. If you're going to say, well, we're going to only measure commodity crops, um, then the difference is not, you know, it's not so clear then. 